Uh, the workshop now continues with our last presentation from a vendor. The title of the presentation is Network Softwareization Impact, and the presentation will be held by Marie Paul Aldini, distinct, distinguished technologist of the CT office of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. She's active in standard development organizations and sees on the ATIs, IEEE, and other standards bodies, is vice chairman of the ATI NFV ISG, sits on the technical steering committee, and is vice chair of the TSD working group uh, and repertoire of SDN work items, and also vice chair of the IEEE SDN. Please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, William. So, um, let's go back to NFV and SDN. The good thing is that uh, I'm last, so now. I think you understand everything about Etsy, uh, about NAV and SDN, and uh, you know everything that was defined by Etsy. And so here, what I will do is uh, give you know maybe you know a kind of complementary perspective and uh, highlight a few points, um, and uh, of course you know leave it open for questions if you still have questions on this topic. So I've um, heard uh, Diego at least and other people talking about um, network uh, software or softwareization, uh, kind of trying to bundle uh, NAV and SDN together. And so I start with that. I think uh, more and more, you know, uh, we need to put these two things together. Um, We're trying to do that uh, in Etsy. We're trying to do that uh, in HP uh, also with our customers. And, uh, and so this is very important. And, and so this network softwareization is basically um, a kind of transformation of the existing network as we've seen uh, today. Uh, it touches any part of the network. Um, so that is very important here. We focused a lot on the fixed network, but obviously, you know, it also touches the mobile network. And uh, actually, lots of the use cases we see today are on the mobile network. Um, it's not really a revolution, as um, pointed by Stephen. There's all the legacy here. So it's you know a step-by-step -step evolution of uh, the existing network, apart from a few new entrants, if any. Uh, but the big thing is that it's really moving uh, away from the box uh, to pure software label uh, on a kind of common uh, set of, uh, as much as possible, standard of the shelf hardware for compute, network, and storage. Um, and so, as such, uh, um, the network component themselves, they may remain hardware, or a part becomes software, or, or almost everything uh, becomes software on the standard servers. Which means that lots of things are being impacted. Uh, we are talking about uh, new architecture, we are talking about new interfaces, um, we are talking about new services, uh, or the way you define services, and uh, I will talk a lot also about new business models. So to start with, um, you know, a bit the basics, uh, there is NFV and SDN, and, uh, and the important thing is how you articulate these things together. We talked a lot about cloud. Uh, somebody mentioned FOG, uh, which stands for edge. Uh, so extending the cloud closer to the customer. And as I said, you know, this is a step approach. So I'll talk a bit about, you know, the different steps. Uh, from the actual uh, virtualization uh, to the more cloudification and then uh, to the decomposition that will en enable this kind of new business models. The important thing also to take into account is that you're starting from legacy. So legacy is incumbent operators, it's network equipment vendors, it's a set of standards and so on. And you're bringing some new forces. So among that is, you know, the kind of move to IT, so the IT vendor play, which is kind of increasing. Uh, the fact that uh, you're talking software, so the entry barrier to get to solutions, network functions, and so on, is much lower. Uh, you don't need to invest so much into specific hardware, it's just pure software. So you get all these startups coming and software vendors and so on. And because we're talking software, it also opens up to a whole bunch of open source uh, type of implementation. So that's where you have now these uh, open source projects coming and not just providing some reference implementation, but also bringing some... I mean, their own way of defining things and their own way to define architecture and interfaces and so on, kind of challenging also standards uh, in a way. Uh, so one of the impact, we're talking impact uh, today, one of the impact on the European um, Commission typically is that we are getting, I'm sitting, uh, I'm the HP representative on um, 
on Etsy. Uh, and we're getting all these mandates from the European Commission uh, to do certain things and so on. Um, and today, I don't, I don't think that the European Commission is sending any mandates to open source typically. Um, so knowing, you know, that there is now um, this element into play, um, I don't know how this is going to be uh, driven uh, moving forward. So now let's look at the steps. So the first step is clearly virtualization. So the point about virtualization is that we move from the box uh, uh, architecture where you know multiple operators have uh, their boxes which are interconnected with some kind of uh, standard interface like you know free gpp and so on broadband uh, forum and so on and uh, we decouple that with hardware and with software but if we look at that i mean uh, you just take the box and you decouple so uh, the first step is just to do that and uh, it has little impact on the interfaces and the architecture so that's what shows on the right hand side the operators remain within the same boundaries, they still have their kind of boxes, except that the boxes are decoupled with, you know, with hardware and software. This is like the first phase. And this already took quite a, a while, you know, to get the vendors to kind of think how they decouple uh, and turn, uh, you know, uh, their box into a software component running on common of the shelves hardware and that's <laughs> where we started working with um, I mean initially that was with BT with Verizon we did actually the first POC which is interesting for this discussion was a virtual BRAS uh, running on standard uh, HP hardware and uh, we worked closely with uh, BT at the time and uh, and with Intel to put accelerators to show that you could uh, assign cores to different functions and get to you know 100 gigabit type of BRS so that that's a bit the starting point then uh, the other point is to actually um, decouple um, not just the hardware, but the virtualized infrastructure. So all this set of hardware with compute, network, storage, virtualization layer, and the management of that. So this is back to one comment, which was to combine the NFV infrastructure with its management. So NFV, I press Vim, and to put that as a kind of cloud layer and then on top of that, deploy the different software uh, of, the di of the different network functions. This is what I would call cloudification. Um, and this is something that is also happening. Lots of service providers typically are putting you know, big data center for these telecom functions and uh, starting to you know, source you know, the equipment for this uh, kind of telco data center mm -hmm. with sometimes some requirements which are a bit specific and so on. That's you know what uh, Diego mentioned in terms of is it pure standard hardware or is it you know a bit customized. But this is, I mean, uh, basically this cloudification. And in that sense, if you look at the operator and interactions, uh, this doesn't um, dramatically change uh, either uh, the way um, the network are being architect and uh, the interactions between the operators because each operator is kind of deploying its telco cloud and putting its virtual functions on it and then the interactions remain pretty much at the same level with the kind of same initial standard interface. So if I take a, a few examples here, I have this cloudification and uh, and I have, um, you know, a couple of use cases here where I have an operator that is, for instance, having uh, two uh, cloud, so two uh, point of presence, and may want to move some functions uh, from one place to the other. Um, the impact uh, may be uh, not on the interface between the operators so much and so on. It's still, I mean, following the kind of uh, standard uh, free GPP <laughs> and so on <laughs> interface. But the impact may be on data retention. Uh, that's something we have not talked too much about here. But if you're moving functions from different clouds, potentially these different clouds, even within the same operator, may be located in different countries for operators that span across uh, multiple countries. And so what you thought was ex executed or stored in a given location may move to a different location. And it's still within the same operator's boundaries. It's all virtualized, so it happened very smoothly and transparently and whatever, but you know, it's not located at the same location. So that's one thing maybe to look into in this cloudification uh, phase. <laughs> then there is the next phase, which is to um, have this cloud, this virtual function, and to start to orchestrate these functions to have that uh, a bit more automated. Uh, and so again, this is the same uh, operators, same kind of high-level interface, uh, same standard interface. 
So high level, there's no real impact. Um, but this way, I mean, uh, it's a bit the same as previously. Um, Previously, you had no real automatic programmatic um, orchestration, so the move of the functions was a bit manual. Here, it's kind of orchestrated. It can be even more dynamic. It can be even more programmatic, but the end result is a bit the same. You can move functions from one location to the other, so there may be an impact on things like data retention. So we talked about virtualization, we talked about cloudification, now is the next step, which is decomposition. So here it's a bit more um, uh, revolutionary, I would say, because here you start to tackle the different functions. So you start to tackle, you know, uh, BRAS, if we take, you know, uh, the example we yeah. used earlier, or if you start to uh, look into the mobile core, and you start to decouple the functions. So one, I mean, classical example is to decouple data plane and control plane. But it could be other things, you know, you could decouple signaling from other things, you could decouple databases from other things. And you create all these components. And so initially these components could be coming all from the same vendor, and so it's a kind of uh, same kind of box, but architect a bit differently and orchestrated, you know, uh, I mean, managed by, you know, that same single vendor. Or ultimately it could uh, become a bit more complex uh, with uh, multi-vendor. So the first um, impact of that uh, on the architecture of the network is um, clearly that the architecture becomes a bit more complex. Instead of having your three boxes initially, you now have six uh, I mean boxes, virtual software components, and you interconnect this. So the actual architecture of your network is, uh, is a bit different. And, and as such, you you create some new interfaces, so between uh, NFV 1A and uh, I mean VNF 1A and VNF 2B, you have a kind of uh, new interface potentially, and so on. So you, you create different interfaces, uh, different architecture, and then you can combine these things. Um, so you can have uh, multiple <coughs> vendors, uh, like uh, at the top I have the grey vendor A, I have the pink vendor B. So not only your functions are decomposed, but they can be sourced through different vendors, and then they can be deployed, you know, through different architecture. You can have everything on the same kind of telco cloud. You can have things on uh, different uh, instance point of presence. You can have this uh, telco cloud point of presence uh, owned by a different provider. Uh, and the combination of these uh, functions may change. So it starts to become, uh, you know, a bit, um, I mean, a bit tricky, not only, but it also provides lots of options. So uh, it's not just, you know, a set of uh, interfaces, it's multiple options, multiple uh, business models. Um, and so looking into the impact of that on uh, regulation, requires, as we discussed a bit earlier, to really study, you know, all the different kind of options <laughs> for different services. So that's kind of uh, huge work. <laughs> Just to pick a few, uh, if I look at the mobile core, for instance, one typical example that uh, is often used is the decoupling of a user plane and control plane on the mobile core. And so here you find, you know, the classical components of the mobile core with the EPC, uh, MME, PGW, SGW. If you decouple uh, user plane, control plane, instead of having three elements, you now have six elements. And then these elements you can dispatch. You can dispatch closer to the customer, closer to the edge. So we expand this cloud notion that we had to the fog, which is like this edge function. And you can put some of the user plane functions towards the edge, and you keep your control plane functions towards the cloud. And how do you communicate with them? Uh, well, user plane, you know, the trend is to, op to open up, uh, you know, SDN type of interface. You have open flow, SDN controllers, and then you have the choice having uh, SDN controller interactions, having an SDN controller at the edge and SDN controller at the cloud, or you could share the same SDN controller that is managing both the cloud and the edge, but then it depends who owns the uh, cloud, who owns the edge, if it's the same operator, you know, it's kind of flexible. You don't need to have open interface so much. If it's two different operators, then you need to talk about open interfaces and so on. So that opens up a whole bunch of other options. And, um, and then comes the questions, do you really want to open up, 
your SDN controller interface or do you want to have a layer of abstraction on it? Uh, is it going to be an intent interface or is it just going to be a set of policies and so on with different northbound interface flavor for different customers? I mean, that is still open questions. So overall, um, to kind of summarize this first um, step, we today have um, you know, a set of projects. Uh, if we look at what is happening in the market, you had, a, you know, a bit of example from different uh, service providers here. But clearly, I mean, today, everybody has been focusing on trying to get to this uh, breaking the box type of things, uh, getting, you know, hardware and software and tackling, you know, the SDN, the data plane, control plane topic. But so far, it's been kind of silo projects, uh, Lots of prototypes, a few deployments, but for things pretty isolated, islands and so on. The next step is really, and it's happening, as I've said, you know, to move that to a cloud, to, to have a common infrastructure within the same uh, given operator and to move the virtual functions on top of that. Then the next step is to decouple that with multiple clouds and uh, different vendors for the virtual network functions and different actors. And as you can see, you know, this is like the kind of end model where you have new business model with different actors providing different services, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's a virtual network functions, whether it's a network service and so on. And everything being programmatic with SDN, with NAV orchestration, all of that is like moving parts. Uh, one day or one hour, you have this architecture, and the second hour, things have moved around, you have a different architecture. This is the future. <laughs> like, very dynamic things. If you look at the actual network, as we've said, we've talked a lot about, you know, uh, the access network and uh, uh, broadband access network and carrier Ethernet and so on, but if you look at the whole picture, it's a bit more than that. It's, you know, it's mobile, it's fixed, and and so on, and uh, with Wi-Fi and so on, it's actually a mix of the two. Um, and uh, and a given um, location may host, you know, uh, services for both uh, mobile or fixed uh, networks. So what um, is kind of uh, common to all these networks is that um, there's going to be kind of points of presence, uh, closer to the edge, more in the middle, and some in the back. Uh, this point of presence will provide a kind of common architecture with hardware resources, with a virtualization layer, and then software functions. And then there will be some control points. So there will be like layer two control points with SDN controllers. There will be, you know, more NAV virtual function orchestration with NAV orchestrator. Uh, there may be other layers of um, orchestration with kind of service orchestration and so on. And, uh, and there will be multi-vendor and there will be multi-operator. So somebody will own this piece. Uh, I mean, somebody may own just the virtualized infrastructure at the edge on this point of presence. Somebody may own this virtual function as a service. Somebody may own this network service. Somebody may own this cloud and, uh, and so on. And uh, if you're not happy with that provider, you may move your functions to this other provider just dynamically. So there were some questions. Um, so, I mean, lots of, lots of things have been said about these questions, so I'm not sure, you know, uh, uh, my points will be um, adding so much more on that. Um, but one of the questions was, you know, whether SDN and NAV enables fixed network access, uh, giving uh, alternative network operators more control. And so my question, I mean, my answer would be, you know, yes, if you look, you know, at the technology and so on, uh, everything gets virtualized. So your DSLAM or your BRAS and so on, that gets virtualized. I mean, we've done enough uh, proof concepts and so on to show that, you know, this is feasible. You can run that on kind of uh, standard hardware. You can have a virtualization layer. You can have SDN with SDN controller to control the layer two. And technology speaking, um, this, is, uh, this is something that is <coughs> possible. Now, if you look at the um, local loop uh, line sharing across uh, two operators, there's also a um, you know, number of uh, effort going on uh, in the standardization. So, I mean, in HC, we define a number of use cases, but as mentioned before by Steven and others, uh, we haven't got into the detail of the actual use cases. We spend most of the work on uh, the actual architecture and uh, the interfaces and so on. 
So um, even though we have a special work item on SDN and AV, which is looking into uh, other type of uh, um, combined architecture, and I will give a few examples, we haven't really picked you know, one use case like this local loop thing. Um, but nevertheless, there are other entities that are starting to leverage our NAV SDN work and look into these specific use cases. So Broadband Forum that was mentioned by uh, Fabian, I think, is definitely looking into that, but it's very early stage. I mean, I looked at the specs again yesterday. This is table of content and a few paragraphs, but this is still very early stage. ITU also is starting to look into that, but also, you know, very early stage. So in terms of uh, mapping, you know, this kind of NLV SDN concepts and architecture and even interface as they are defined today to, you know, use cases like that and get into a common understanding on how this can be deployed, the different options, the different interfaces, how, I mean, what kind of adaptation you need to provide on the interface, this is not there yet. So, um, so again, if we look at that from an architecture point of view, um, one way to look at that is to consider that uh, you have multiple residential customers. Uh, these may be um, served by different operators. So you have operator one, operator two, uh, but one of them owns uh, the kind of uh, uh, local loop. And so there is a kind of aggregation uh, and BNG layer where this traffic needs to be dispatched to the two different operators. And as we've said, since you know any of these network functions ultimately has to be, I mean, can be virtualized and potentially will be virtualized, um, nothing prevents you know this shared, I mean, these elements in the middle to be shared, to be virtualized, and to have a layer uh, of um, of control with a layer to control with an SDN controller. I don't know if it shows very well uh, below the green uh, box, but this SDN controller can provide a layer of abstraction, which in our HC and AV architecture we call the WIM today for kind of generic term for, you know, these things which which is shared among different operators. Uh, and uh, and this WIM can provide this layer of abstractions on top of this SDN controller. In some cases, this may be just bundled with the SDN controller. And so the operator one will have his NLV orchestrator connecting to that, uh, and the operator two will also have his NLV orchestrator connecting to that. Except that today, I mean, this interface, I don't know if I, yeah, I touched on that <coughs> here. This interface today, um, so then, is shared among multiple clients, which means that we have to define uh, this interface, whether it sits on the SDN controller, whether it's uh, a bit above on the WIM, we have to define a common interface that uh, any operator can connect to uh, with uh, you know, certain common parameters and so on. Not just technical interface, but also business aspects um, in terms of uh, pricing and all these kind of things, all the policies and, uh, and it needs to be multi-tenancy, secured, uh, you know, so that um, you don't uh, I mean, you don't have access to your competitors, uh, you know, uh, customers and all these kind of things. So that, that's to be defined. That's not defined today. So the principles are there, but the actual uh, interface to be used in this kind of use case is not defined. Then there were other questions. Will SDN and NLV also be standardized um, in a way um, in a way which will make uh, such forms of network access possible based on NLV? So, um, as I've said, we have defined a number of use cases uh, in E5, uh, which was, you know, the diagram I've shown just earlier, which shows this case where indeed you have, you know, a common set of, um, of um, <coughs> functions which can be shared across multiple operators and controlled with an SDN controller with this abstraction, with which we call WIM today. Uh, but this is as far as we've gone. <laughs> So today, I mean, uh, this is not uh, standardized. We are um, aiming in the phase two, in the phase three of the Etsy work, which is going to start uh, very soon, uh, to push uh, these kind of requirements to uh, interface specification. So we hope to get to this point. Uh, we are also aiming to refine the use cases, and this one would definitely be a good candidate. But this is to be done. 
Um, if we look at the other aspects, I've mentioned the virtualization of the BNG, BRS, and so on, of the Ethernet access network. Um, this is not standardized either. Um, I mean, I've mentioned BBF is a bit working on it, but this is uh, still early stage. Um, if we talk about the multi-tenancy on the SDN controller, I mean, uh, I think uh, Sarah, somebody mentioned that uh, this is not uh, done yet in ONF. Well, if you look at the open source, this is not really done either. Uh, I think it's Stephen who mentioned that, yes, we talk about multi-tenancy, but this is very much multi-tenancy to allow multiple applications. It's not multi-tenancy to allow multiple operators with you know everything which uh, comes with it. So there is um, still lots of work to be done in that space. Then the other questions was, with, um, will SDN and NAV also be offered by vendors, uh, which will make such forms of network access possible based on SDN and NAV? So again, I mean, um, of course, we have different tracks in parallel. Uh, there is standardization, there is open source, there is what vendors do, there are some uh, proof of concept with a mix of that. There are some vendor experimentation with operators. There are a few early deployment. But I mean, all of these things uh, happen a bit in parallel. For the virtual BNG, I mean, I know as HP, we are working with some vendors uh, to, I mean, yeah, to finalize, to optimize uh, virtualized architecture uh, and integration with orchestration layers and so on. So these things are happening. Um, to my knowledge, there is no open source in that space. Um, the interface, NFVO, SDN controller, I mean, again, uh, most of the NFV orchestrator vendor uh, have integration with SDN controllers, whether it's their own SDN controller or the flagship open source SDN controller. So again, this is happening, uh, but not to the extent of what we've discussed here with all the multi-tenancy and all of that. Um, and uh, if we talk about you know, the inter-SDN controller or the inter-WIM uh, or the WIM uh, NFVO or the inter-NFVO. There is some work, again, there at different level. ATIS is working on the NFV orchestrator interconnect, I would say. Uh, but again, this is very early stage. Somebody mentioned that you, know, you cannot do that if you don't have a catalog. This is something that is also underway. I mean, ATIS is working on a catalog. TM Forum is working on a catalog. There are things happening. Uh, case number three, virtual edge. So I talked about this cloud and then this edge thing. Um, so one uh, aspect that is being worked also is to share the mobile edge. So we, we talked a lot about the access network and the broadband, uh, but um, and the regulation on, on this broadband aspects. Uh, but lots of things are moving also on the mobile space. and. Um, and this uh, mobile edge computing, which is uh, defining a kind of uh, virtual shared open base station where there would be a kind of a shared virtualized infrastructure and on top of it, different uh, network functions could be stored, I mean stored, installed, deployed, and so on. This could come from different operators um, uh, for different type of applications. So here I have, uh, an example uh, of this kind of uh, network sharing at the edge uh, for both mobile edge and, uh, and CDN, and I'll come to that. And you have multiple operators. So here you have an operator one, which is deploying uh, you know, his mobile core user plane, for instance, at the edge. That's the example we used earlier. But there may be another the top provider, like you know, just to name uh, one, which is you know, very popular with this type of use cases, which is a content provider, Netflix, that wants to have you know, caching and some functions, CDN functions at the edge of the network, both for the fixed line and for the mobile. And so the over-the-top provider could have some virtual functions on this um, mobile edge platform. But they could be also another operator that wants, you know, to have uh, extra capacity towards the edge for some over-the-top, machine-to-machine, uh, -machine for instance, uh, transcoding or... Um, video analysis or, I mean, there are many use cases being um, uh, discussed these days that may also want to use this capacity at the edge from another provider for his services. And this can be, this can be pretty uh, static, like, you know, plan in advance, well-defined, pretty stable and so on, but this can be pretty dynamic as well. Uh, 
like you know suddenly there is this event which was not you know anticipated which is uh, having lots of users downloading this specific video and so on and uh, and there is some video compression, video transcoding, caching, and so on, which is being requested. And suddenly, you know, this over the top provider who, or this, you know, part of the operator wants to have extra capacity at the edge. And this is just on the fly, on demand. So this is, um, I think, uh, where the network sharing is really extending uh, to this edge and also to the mobile edge. So. I mean, talking to some regulators, you know, people at lunchtime and so on, we were debating, well, you know, the mobile network is not so much regulated and so on. But if you want this to be, I mean, really done in a fair matter with open interfaces and so on, with net neutrality and so on, I don't know. I mean, maybe um, space for thought. <laughs> uh, then question number three was the value chain. Uh, so value chain is a complex topic. Uh, there are many different ways to define the value chain. Uh, but if we take one, you know, where you have uh, today the customer premise, the access, the core, and the services, I mean, this is, you know, uh, one value chain. And so if we see the impact on this way of looking at the value chain with NFV and SDN, based on what we said, we said, you know, infrastructure, data plane can be decoupled from, let's say, control plane, from softwareization of the functions. So you can at least you know, see a layer where you have infrastructure with different players. You can have you know, one owning this net NFVI node, another one no owning this other part of the network, another one owning this uh, point of presence, and another one owning this other cloud, and there may be others, and so on. So this one is already <laughs> becoming a bit complex. And then on top of that, you have the VNF. So you may have multiple vendors, but you may have also multiple providers of VNF as a service for different parts of the network, whether it's a virtual CP or you know, a, an EPC, mobile core, control plane, or whatever. And then, and then you combine these things. So then you have network services. So you may have a service provider providing a network service you know, for virtual CP, and then another one providing network service for you know, mobile core. And, uh, but that's not all. You may have another service provider that is building on top of those. So I put three layers, but you could build on top of that. And uh, it could be across countries and, and so on. So the value chain becomes really complicated, uh, especially if you think that you know, within this VNF, you actually have VNF components, and you can have actually decouple that and with different vendors. And, and you have SDN controllers, and you could share SDN controllers among different uh, vendors, different operators. I mean, that's, that's complicated. Relationship with all over the top. Uh, we've touched a bit in on that with the use case of the edge. Um, and you've seen all the different options, you know, in terms of architecture, in terms of uh, business model, in terms of value chain. So I would say, you know, that there are many options. Uh, I've listed a few here. Uh, I know that, you know, a number of service providers are looking into, you know, these um, different use cases on how to generate revenues out of this technology to, you know, capture some of the revenues from over the top. Um, so there is, you know, offering virtual resources and AVI, offering VNF as a service, auto scaling, offer edge capacity, uh, virtual resources on customer premises, and I mean, the list is, is pretty long. So do SDN and NAV have other regulatory implications? Uh, I would say yes. <laughs> I've mentioned, you know, a few like uh, data retention, like uh, network sharing, you know, uh, towards the edge, including on the mobile, um, all the questions about localization of the resources. Um, if you have a, like an MVNO across multiple operators, uh, you know that, you know, uh, I mean, this traffic, uh, you know, can, uh, can switch from one place to the other. So. Uh, you have uh, some impacts there. You can have uh, some tenant SDN controller controlling uh, infrastructure service provider and also, you know, reroute uh, part of the traffic. Um, and then there's security topics. I mean, uh, I mean, we would need a whole workshop to talk about, you know, security. As soon as you introduce, I mean, as, as said earlier, you know, you can use the basic principles of securing your infrastructure and your services. You have, you know, uh, um, access control, uh, rules and uh, all these kind of things. 
Uh, but nevertheless, when you introduce software and you introduce open source, uh, you introduce new challenges, you introduce new opportunity for hacking, you introduce all these kind of things. We looked, I mean, just to pick a few examples. In HCNV, we looked into you know, security with OpenStack. I mean, it was mentioned earlier, so nothing new here. But it's very complex. And, and this thing is like changing every six months or even sooner. So, I mean, something that you have assessed, you know, at some point, six months later, you have to just redo the work. Uh, so that's one example. And uh, it's not just OpenStack. I mean, these open source projects, they pop up every single, you know, every other day, maybe not single day, but every other day, every time I, I try to update this chart, it's like, you know, there's so many new things. And today we got the last list from ONF and there were like three other things that I had never heard about. There's some uh, attempt to do some federation. So OPNFV was launched uh, with that objective to federate uh, the open source projects around NFV and SDN and bring a reference implementation, uh, not especially creating new stuff, but putting the things together and getting these different projects to agree on uh, interfaces and interface behavior and all of that. And there is a first release, a new release is coming out very soon that, I mean, includes all these different components. But as said, I mean, this is expanding and OPNV is just defining its scope, expanding into broader areas, including the NFVO and so on. So I will close with you know, what HP is doing. Um, you're probably aware that you know, we are very active in this space. We were one of the founding uh, members of uh, HCNV in the first place, very active in SDN, chairing or vice sharing most of these committees, uh, both in standardization, open source, very active as an industry player. We have uh, offering in uh, most of the parts of this uh, picture, uh, hardware, NFV layer, um, Veeam OpenStack, carrier grade OpenStack, uh, SDN controllers and so on. We have an NFV orchestrator. We recently launched an upper layer for service orchestration um, across multiple NFV orchestrator. Uh, we have a few VNF, but we very much partner with uh, partners. Um, I mean, equipment vendors, uh, some people in the room here and startups and so on. We have, um, yeah an open NAV labs, which is very open uh, for partners to integrate. And we have uh, launched recently a catalog, so a marketplace catalog. I skip that. Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> as you understand, I've not answered any more questions than anybody else. I've just highlighted that, yes, you know, it's quite complex. There's lots of things going on and there's some more work. And regulation in this world, as it is today, it's definitely a big challenge, so thank you. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. There's room for one short question. If this is not the case, then uh, we move on to the panel discussion. Uh, the title of the, present of the panel discussion is what are the regulatory implications of SDN and NFV? And the panel discussion will go through the questions which were uh, presented uh, this morning in the presentation introduction and also answered in the presentations of the day. And the first question is, will SDN and NFV enable fixed network access which will provide alternative network operators with more control over the network of the incumbent compared to current layer two host mm -hmm. access products, which are also known as virtual abundant local access and uh, Ethernet bitstream. And this question was answered in the presentations of the day. And maybe one could summarize uh, the presentations as follows. In principle, this is possible, but whether this will, this will actually be the case needs to be seen. And a reason is that SDN and NFV currently is in a rather initial stage. And the focus of the initial stage is on, um, th on the use of SDN and NFV within one single domain of a network operator. And this new uh, fixed network access would need an approach across different uh, network domains. <coughs> And this is possible in principle, but adds further complexity and several issues that were presented today needs to be resolved, for example, security. 
And now it would be of interest to hear the view of the presenters. What would be necessary or helpful to ensure or support that SDN and NFV will actually develop in a way which will make this new form of fixed network access uh, possible? <coughs> Who has an answer to this question? I, I do. <laughs> uh, I, I have to say we will move to the uh, to the the next question is the question with regard to uh, in interconnection services and new Ethernet services which are developed uh, by MEF. Here we have the focus on the traditional Ethernet bitstream products or the traditional version of my local access which are typically no EPL or, 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 or products as specified by, by MEF. Uh, please, yes. I just wanted to come at this in a different way because we've sort of had a technical look at this at the question of SDN and NFV. <coughs> um, uh, there are no free rides. Who in the industry is going to do the work? I think it'll probably have to be the vendors. What is the business case for the vendors who today derive something like 80% of their revenue from hardware and 20% from software? Uh, for vendors to invest heavily in SDN and NFV, they will have to figure out a com an entirely different mode of operation, right? Their revenue model is being fundamentally threatened. Um, I think that they are um, perhaps playing games a little bit under the pressure of service providers to pretend that they're very comfortable <laughs> with <coughs> these new developments. But in point of fact, their revenue for this quarter and the next quarter and the following quarter are derived only in to a very small degree from SDN and NFV. I think the consequence of that will be <coughs> that there's going to be a, a, um, a period of rationalization coming fairly soon. I would think within the next six months to a year, not right away, within the six, six months or a year, where the industry is going to figure out from this vast uh, canvas, um, and you've just presented it uh, very well, from this vast canvas, where really do we start to make this for real? Um, <coughs> virtual NID seem to be a reasonable candidate. Um, security is a strong candidate, although um, <coughs> if security or an, and other uh, virtualized functions are, are to come from startups, in Silicon Valley, startups are now being starved for capital and startups are going to have a very, very difficult time selling directly. So they would have to sell indirectly with some sort of subscription base through service providers. That the, 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 the uh, sales cycle for that kind of, uh, to, to be successful commercially with that kind of arrangement is very long. So um, I'm just wanting to paint a slightly different <laughs> picture with some caution and, um, <clears throat> and just the thought that I think, um, you know, if we, if we remind ourselves what did happen to ISDN, what did happen to ATM, they were corrected essentially by the marketplace. Uh, anyone else who would like to have a few? Yes. Uh, okay, so I kind of sort of agree with, with Bob that, 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 that where this is going to happen, where it makes sense for it to happen, where there's a business case, where the problem is relatively easy to solve. And I think, um, I think with respect to the specific questions about um, vendors who rely on a lot of hardware, I think perhaps NFV won't happen quite as quickly across all the segments as we think, although there is some evidence that it's already hitting investment because people are waiting to see whether it's worth investing lots of money in hardware. But I think <coughs> the ability for vendors to slow this down is rather limited because there are new vendors on the block who have not invested in hardware. And it is perhaps interesting that there are some barriers with some <coughs> virtual network functions that don't exist 
in this new vendor community that perhaps do exist in the previous vendor community. So I think it is going to be, and someone, I can't remember who, but they did comment quite reasonably, I thought, that this feels a bit like when we stepped away from legacy voice towards voice over IP to the extent that the industry is changing and it consensus that's been around for quite a long time is changing and it is going to shake out and it is going to be a different landscape. But other than the general direction of travel, which is it is going to happen and these new services are going to happen where there's money to be made, it isn't really possible to see exactly what that looks like right now. <laughs> Maybe I can add some words. From my perspective and from, from the experience, I think, which most of us from the last decades uh, are, that if you uh, keep this with the vendors, then normally every vendor comes in the first phase with its own solution. Because every vendor wants to earn some money and has the problem of, uh, today it's mainly hardware-driven revenue. If you go to software-driven revenue, you have to differentiate in some fashion. So from an oper operator perspective, you have multi-vendor in place for access, for aggregation, for core, or even within one, di uh, one um, layer, you have a multi-vendor or dual-vendor strategy. So to, to keep this field to the vendors might be difficult because you can't deploy it in your network when having different vendors in place and every vendor comes up with this own specific solution. So the, the, the requirements, the demands must come from the market, from the, from the consumers, effectively. The consumers consume some products and out of those products you have to uh, fill your, your requests and then you place the request either with the vendors or you have to integrate the different vendor solutions in the first phase by yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I would see an orchestrator or some, some kind of umbrella management system in the first phase to be set up by the uh, operators themselves but hopefully in an exchange between the operators to enable networks to communicate with each other. Uh, this first question has not so much the focus whether SDN and NLV will be developed and implemented in the networks, but more what is necessary that if it will be developed and used in the networks, what is necessary that it will be developed in a way that it will also enable this new form of fixed network access, which may be of interest for alternative network operators that they can have a wholesale product which gives more flexibility and more control over the networks. Therefore, maybe alternative network operators need to engage themselves in what way ever in the process of development of SDN and NFV in order that their views, what should be possible, really will be developed. What do you think on this? Yeah, you, have, you have to check what your requirements might be about. So. Normally, you have, you have to verify, for example, what are your problems today? Where, where are your pain points and what should be solved by SDN and NFV? And out of this, you have to, have, have to check what could be done and whom to talk to. From, from a development perspective, if, if you talk about what alternatives could do based on your network, you have to talk to the alternatives, ask them what they would need and what the business case out of it would be. You would never deploy anything where you don't earn money with. Okay. Maybe make we may like, uh, maybe it's good to make it uh, rather concrete. You have presented a rather concrete proposal what should be possible with Aston NFV with the case in Germany. What now is needed that this will be really developed in that way, Aston NFV, that that solution will be possible? From, from my understanding, in, in the first phase, you have to define an API between the different SDN and NFV orchestrators. Every network will have its own orchestration somehow, and you have to define how those two networks will interact. You have to specify what, what parameters have to be exchanged. Mm -hmm. So in the first phase, you, you start with what products, what services do I want to sell, and what do I need to know to, to create such a service, and what do I need to communicate and exchange with the other network? Yeah. So what are the parameters? Yes. Talking about Ethernet, we have different parameters than talking about IP. So look at the product you want to sell over a different network, or you want to sell based on your network to others, and then talk to the other networks. How could we exchange those informations for setting up okay. such a product end to end? But now you have the concept. What is the next step for QSC? Will you give this, this concept to open? Uh, source projects? Will you create with other alternative operators open source projects? Will we develop this or will the alternative operators in Germany create a board and collect all views and, and try, to, uh, try to find a common solution that all alternative network operators in 
alternate network operators in Germany would like to have and bring this in in the standardization, for example, Etsy or IEEE, what would be an appropriate uh, method to make this really happen? My wish would, would be to have a board not necessarily only for Germany, but maybe for Europe, because the market is then bigger and stronger afterwards to go to the standardization bodies, for example, but to have a board out of operators interested in this field and get an exchange about what an API could look like. What, what different operators see as, as the necessity to set up in their network, what is in place, where they are they planning to go to, and to have a voluntarily <laughs> exchange about what should we commonly do to enable such networks to get an in interaction. Thank you. So you had, um, okay. It works, yes, okay. Um, there was a suggestion earlier that to, this is going to proceed where there is um, value to all the players in, in making it happen. And uh, there's a sort of corollary to that, that it's going to happen in the simpler cases first. So it's, um, and, and that's part of the reason why I think um, a lot of the uh, initial deployments that people talk about are, are single provider deployments because it's easier to get things running in a single provider than when you've got two, three, however many providers involved in the, in the, in the particular scenario. Because uh, even within the one provider, you still have all of the issues of how to integrate um, pieces from multiple vendors and, and that's a significant challenge in this environment. Within the single, um, provider case, I think there is still a, a sort of step between the, um, uh, the like the enterprise layer two services before you get to the retail layer two services, just because of the scale. If you're trying to do retail layer two services, again, you get into many more points of presence that you've got to touch, you've got many more uh, players you've got to deal with, uh, and getting it worked out on the enterprise scale first is probably going to make sense for a lot of players. So I, I suspect that's going to be a common first step for many people. Just yep. forget. <laughs> no, two, 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 two reflections when it comes to talk about orchestrators. First is that what many of us understand as an orchestrator right now is an almighty entity that controls everything. Uh, that control of everything <coughs> is something that is not, let's say, rational to expect that will be uh, situated outside of the administrative domain of whatever company that is providing whatever the service, whether telecommunication, electricity, water, or if you like, I don't know, uh, what producing wine. This is a reality, the only way. So. Uh, thinking that there will be a super orchestrator orchestrating the orchestrators is something that is, oof, at least looks scary to me. Because that uh, reminds me of the old, uh, uh, this old uh, ITUT, what I was supposed to call CCITT even, long time ago. You remember the red books, the blue books and all the like, with the, with the root of all trust that was going to be operated by United Nations. Never happened. So this is... Uh, so, the only way to do that is precisely, and this is something that, let me insist, by precisely a, a, a um, adequate level of abstraction that allows you to reason about network properties and not about the network itself. But that it would be probably is to be at a too high level just to uh, be dedicated to precisely an unbundling of the layer two interface because it's too much detail on the how and not very much focus on the what. Yes, but I think that is the idea here on the side uh, from QSC to create a board where the alternate network operators could agree on a common view what should be possible and then the orchestrator net no, need not to be almighty but maybe develop in a, in a direction which make no. at least some things possible. I mean, th this is, I, I would say that's already happening. I mean, something, something that if you look at what uh, people is doing in Etsy, pe what people is doing in the ITF, so it's something that is already happening is maybe in some cases, recently I received a, a message from a, a colleague that is working in one of the vendors not here, uh, that uh, about an idea he had about, he has about f a federation of, uh, of uh, networking um, um, control. Well, this is something, I mean, and this is he's proposing to bring it to the to the IRTF as okay. a research matter for the uh, okay. for the IRTF. Okay, but my impression today was that there 
I think in the presentation from you that several maybe severe issues needs to be cleared, like secure uh, needs to be cleared like security and so on mm -hmm. before it's possible to have an interoperator interface. And uh, it seems it's not too completely easy. It has complexity, but maybe it's possible. Oh. We have seen in the presentation of Julie Beckett that many things are possible. Definitely, and yeah. some critical, critical points need to be resolved. The, 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 the point here is that not only that they are possible, is that something that is important as well is that they, whether they have a business value, a clear business value. Yes, but for, for the for the whole uh, for, for the whole set of operators, which is something that we have to carefully analyze. Well, uh, not only a, a business value. If we are, if we are, um, and if we're talking about regulation, whether whether it uh, it would work for the greater good, so to say. So, so this is something that we have to, because things that are possible, we have many, and some of them, and we have to be clear that some of them are very uh, are uh, should be applied, but in a very much control environment. Okay, thank you. We have uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just want okay. to bounce back on the comment on the vendors and so on. I think it's a bit chicken and egg. I mean, the technology is there. The vendors would do, you know, uh, whatever the service provider want, you know, to deploy. Um, and to me, I mean, it seems to me that, I mean, sharing the point of presence uh, in a number of cases that should reduce, you know, cost. Uh, I mean, preventing from having, you know, footprint in a location where maybe you don't have so much traffic, but just, you know. And, uh, and so if there is, um, you know, an economic reason for a service provider to do that, they should do that. Today, I mean, my understanding is that they don't do that because they don't have control on the resources. They, they don't have control on the network. So if we can agree on this, you know, open API uh, with technical, you know, capabilities, with business terms, uh, ensure net neutrality, ensure that, you know, this service is offered at a fair price, you know, if you scale on demand uh, with uh, little notice, uh, it's not going to be at a, uh, you know, um, astronomic price. I mean, all these kind of things, uh, then, you know, it should happen because there's a rationale to share and to save money and energy and all these kind of things. Well, well I shall not comment on uh, <laughs> uh, vendors and uh, whether it's, uh, you know, SDN and NVR are disruptive for vendors, but I come back to the root of the question, which is, uh, we change the name of the game between alternative uh, and incumbent operators. And I would say, you know, whether you call it VULA or Bitstream or uh, um, NFV, uh, SDN enabled the VULA, uh, I would say it's always uh, the wholesale line rental uh, uh, product. It's something that uh, offers you a complement not to be eliminated from an RFP, but it's not something that uh, justifies that you exist. Uh, what is interesting in NFV and SDN uh, over uh, third-party networks is that it can raise for the whole community of uh, service providers and users the level of interoperability. That's the important thing. Uh, can, um, can we do things that to all together that uh, we could not do yesterday? But uh, it will be available to all players. It will not per se change uh, the um, dynamics of, uh, of competition. Yes, please, uh, yeah. Sandra. Um, so I'm going to move away from the question again. Um, but in terms of the, a board, I'm not sure that another board is necessarily the right solution. I think it's quite, uh, there's a lot of commonality between the responses today and from all of the speakers, um, the issues that still need to be resolved to achieve this in terms of interoperability, etc. Uh, and I think that the communities are in place already. We've had the list of all the organizations involved. So it would be uh, more operators, more carriers contributing in those spaces, joining the conversation that's already taking place. I think that would be valuable. And one more thing before you <laughs> um, just on security, um, just I think it's come out as a, a obviously a really strong element that we need to address. Um, but just to note again that it, the community is aware of the issues, and it's not it sh it's not going to be something that will um, uh, halt the progress of SDN and NFE. There are a lot of a lot, actually a lot of work already happening 
Um, certainly over the last two years, there's been a really increased focus on security um, from what each of the groups is a, a working group probably in each of these organizations looking at security um, and working together. There's a lot of work in the research community uh, as well around uh, technical solutions. Um, it requires more um, people contributing, so if there are people interested in your, your organizations, um, certainly welcome more contributions on, on that level, but there is move, movement towards uh, addressing the issues. Okay, maybe you, or, or we move on. We need to move on to the next question. Or would you like to respond? Just a qu quick add on, on this, or what I said. All the standardization bodies and the vendors, they are all talking about new technologies which you could easily use if you start on a green field. But most of the operators have an existing network. And you should pay attention to, to this in, in some fashion. So from my perspective, you have to talk about what sh should what are we planning to commonly achieve, not what can the technology do for us. Because as of today, maybe we can start with a service which is not yet based on a complete, full automated orchestration, but maybe some smaller parts are still with older uh, protocols or, or older or even manual processes. But you can already um, acknowledge on the API what should we do right now. And we can today 80%, tomorrow we can do 90%, and uh, in three years we can do one. 100%. We should not wait for this to happen in three years when everything is there, but already start to, to discuss the business case and the real use. I, I think okay. I just, yeah, just to point out that there is 100%, I mean, I 100% agree with you, and I think that the community also sees that. There's migration working groups in the ONF, and um, also in others, and they totally understand that you're moving from hybrid uh, and MEF as well. Um, from like People have legacy deployments, and they cannot possibly just deploy uh, green fields, so I would certainly point towards some of that brownfield. Thank you. Uh, any comment or question in, of anyone in the audience? Okay, then uh, we move on to the next question. Will SDN and NFV enable new forms of interconnection for data or Ethernet uh, services based on which operators can offer new data or Ethernet services which enables their customer to set up data or Ethernet connections on demand uh, in real time, rather similar to a phone call. This question was answered in the presentations today, and in most presentations, the answer was yes, that's a viable use case, that should be possible, and in the presentation of the MEF and the GOLD, uh, the, um, the information was that, is, that, that GOLD and the MEF is actually working on that topic. GOLD has already services which enable this, and proof of concept with another operators with the interconnection. And therefore, it's maybe rather um, possible that this will be actually the case. And as mentioned before, it's a, if it's a business case, then it will be developed further. It will be developed. From a regulatory point of view, then, a question of interest is network operators, which terminates the Ethernet connections, maybe have then a natural monopoly similar to network operators which terminates phone calls. And then in order to avoid a misuse of market power, it may be necessary to regulate the termination rates of Ethernet services, rather similar as it's the case with phone calls. Uh, of course, we are interested in the f uh, uh, what is the view of, of, of cold or on and the, and, and the math on that? Well, uh, we're a long way. Um, you know, uh, between uh, now and uh, a monopoly on uh, the termination of an Ethernet link. Uh, it's, uh, it's about, you know, whom you provide with. It's, and uh, what we are doing is not, uh, I would say, interacting with uh, anybody, but uh, with having uh, a, um, uh, another provider for, uh, for which you have a link that is dedicated to, uh, to you uh, and to your bought this um, this wholesale link uh, and you can uh, eventually tune it it's not about uh, you know having uh, access to an open directory for all the BNs uh, that are possible mm -hmm. uh, behind uh, the, the network it's you know what you have behind an ENNI is just access to the half circuits you have bought it's not something that is uh, in an uh, open uh, numbering space like uh, you know the, the telephone network so uh, this is uh, the limit I see to your question. Mm -hmm. But if a business customer wants to set up an Ethernet connection to another business customer who is connected to another network, then it has no possibility 
the service provider has to use this network for the termination. There's no alternative. Uh, that's the reason for maybe a natural monopoly because there's just one possibility to terminate. But well, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, Ethernet networks that are uh, uh, closed on every uh, single corporate user, uh, mm -hmm. even if they have premises all over the world. Uh, so it's not about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it, it's not a, a about a network with a, 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 an open numbering uh, or addressing uh, space uh, like the telephone network or the internet. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I think um, I think the critical thing is the fact that you can get the layer two connectivity to the end user at a sensible price. Um, the end user is probably not going to another one of their sites because it's not a very efficient way to build a network, very long layer two links. They probably are wanting to connect their services to, um, to a carrier or to an OTT provider in a data center or something like that. So... So it's about ability to connect to the user rather than this concept that I'm just going to make an open end-to-end -end Ethernet termination because I, I don't think that's going to happen. There's, if nothing else, eventually somebody's got to go to a rack somewhere and connect something up. So it's, it's not quite like a phone call. I just have the impression it, it's a healthy, fluid market, not uh, blocked by uh, vicious uh, monopolists. Um, there could be a couple of exceptions, and I think a very light touch of regulation, whereby, for example, an incumbent would not be allowed to drop their prices so low as to capture the market. So this is kind of upside down <laughs> regulation, but without getting into the details of regulating uh, this speed, this price, I think that's 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 entirely unnecessary. So maybe a couple of a couple of watchdog. Um, for these odd cases, uh, bits of regulation uh, would be sufficient. May, may, may I ask, if, uh, if an incumbent is not allowed to lower the prices, is, uh, is an OTT provider allowed to give them from free? Because th this is really lowering the price, you know? Yeah. And they are allowed to do so, always. So, mm, curious. Just, just, just one more uh, point on that. Um, if I understand the... Uh, the question correctly and, and, and link it to what the MEF is doing in terms of uh, ordering service here. So y the idea is, is, is to enable um, on-demand ordering of service. And, and certainly in the MEF approach, that's abstracted away from the way it's implemented. So it doesn't have to be implemented on SDN or NFE. You could have a, a, a portal where you do this and, and uh, crank it through existing element management systems or something like that, as long as you've met the, uh, the performance requirements associated with this. So um, I think SDN and NFE could facilitate, but they're not. They're, they're a, um, they, they help, but they're not an essential piece of, of that capability. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'm. Is this working? Yeah. I'm Yves Blondel of T Regs. I also want to ask a question on this because I've been sitting here since about 11:30, <laughs> wondering why you made the analogy with the phone call as a regulator and. Um, what your objectives were in asking that question. So I'm asking directly to you, no, no, okay. irrespective of what you've already heard, with, with which, by the way, I agree, uh, how you came to um, have that as an element in your regulatory reflection. As um, mentioned in the question, uh, or, or as I think everybody knows that there is the topic to regulate the termination rates of uh, fixed uh, telephone services or mobile services. and. It was in the beginning not fully clear for us what will be possible with SDN and NFE with regard to data or Ethernet services. And if the services would be re actually rather similar to phone calls, then from a general perspective, it's obvious to ask whether this issue could be erased, uh, could become up in this uh, development with SDN and NFE or not. That's the only point. Perhaps I can just add something here because we also have similar bottlenecks on the internet and we have, sim we have a different charging mechanism, bill and keep, and we have no bottlenecks. So it's probably unclear whether that's, it, it depends very much. Uh, 
I should like to add uh, Alain Maton from the Belgium Regulator. I should like to add only a small remark that in the past, the free relay has such, uh, such uh, uh, facility with the circuit virtual, the switched virtual circuit, but uh, finally never used because due to a lack of demand. But this uh, is an old stuff, this is not new. And maybe one last point. Uh, talking about service agnostic um, approaches of software defined networking. W with your comparison, with, with your um, idea of making the comparison to the phone call, the phone call was charged because somebody had deployed a phone line to the customer, which is the access line. So the regulation more or less was based on the access line. So when talking about virtual unbundled local access and software defined networking on top, you should not be afraid or, or care about regulating Ethernet services or some specific service, but you should regulate more service agnostic the, the traffic or the, the usage of the access line. Okay. Okay, then I think we move on to the next question. <laughs> Uh, uh, the next question is, will S10 NNV enable further new forms of fixed network access and uh, network sharing? And uh, in the presentations, this topic was answered uh, and maybe rather similar as the first question that in principle this is possible. In the presentation of Hewlett Packet it was shown that uh, many things are possible. and. Uh, it's maybe, it's rather similar to the first question. It's, on the other hand, not very, not uh, uh, maybe too early to see what will then po possible. Um, what was also mentioned in the presentation of Hewlett Packet was that uh, these many possibilities may also enable new forms of mobile virtual networks for mobile virtual network operators. And it would be interesting, who of you think that SDN and NFV will actually enable such new, form, uh, uh, new forms of mobile virtual network operators? Please, maybe everybody who thinks that's will be the case could raise your hand. So that's a majority. And maybe it's the same be before, it could be possible and who think that this will actually be developed uh, by I operators and implemented? I Please. think I've seen it. I, th I think I've seen the first beginnings of this where somebody is running a, um, a virtual EPC um, and then using the RAN as uh, just, just radio access. I have absolutely no idea on how the commercials for that work. But that's what this organization claimed to be doing and they had a whole set of um, components that they put together and it's an offering that is <coughs> if it's not in the marketplace it's fairly imminent I think um, so yeah I think I've kind of seen it happen now it's it's probably not NFV as we've envisaged it here where it's all beautiful you can deploy it anywhere <laughs> and mix and match but it's almost certainly virtual EPCs running on commodity tin rather than big blocks of dedicated tin sitting in places. Well, there, there, there have been several uh, claims of people planning to go and put the EPC in, the, in, a, in a cloud provider and having an agreement with whatever the, uh, fi the, the um, op operator owning some antennas to, to provide it. The problem there is that, uh <coughs> and I'm ju just curious about this because the current Quality parameters of cloud providers are loose to be uh, being being uh, I mean be, be, being optimistic. A glitch like the one that Netflix suffered uh, not the, the past Christmas that was a couple of days without service. If you're a virtual mobile network operator, which consequences would have apart from the fact that you're losing your clients or not? I mean, because you're, you're supposed to provide this uh, is a basic service that you're supposed to be providing under, under certain conditions. And this is precisely the other way around. It's pre precisely about the, uh, the SLAs and, and how you sus uh, provide a sustainable uh, service and how you enforce that, that back to your, to your cloud providers, which is, would open a, 
an interesting uh, consideration as well. Or, or in case of an emergency, which is something that, for example, not here, but the Japanese, whenever you talk with the Japanese, one of the main ap applications they see for all of this is precisely to enhance the resiliency and the availability of the networks in the case of a natural um, event. Um, from, from my perspective, the mobile operators have one big advantage. They are quite ahead of the fixed network operators because they are used to the concept of roaming. It's already established that a physical network operator, an MNO, well, mobile network operator, <laughs> has its own network but can steer the traffic of his customer and other operators' networks once he crosses the border. His, there are a variety of models um, how roaming can work, but it's also standardized with, within including call control. And there are not only protocols like this, but also more and more open source software. You can set up a home location router completely based on open source software as of today. But I, w I would say, by the way, on particularly this case of an EPC and a RAN and a vir mobile virtual network operator, this is as much about if you're an actual network operator with physical hardware, you have to make the decision to open your RAN up to a third-party EPC. And actually, it doesn't matter if it's NFV or TIN. That is the fundamental enabler for that service because if the mobile operators say no, what you've done is built a load of virtual tin in the cloud that you can't use for anything. Okay. Thank you for your opinions. Uh, then we need to move on to the next questions with, which have a focus on the economic perspective and now I hand over. Thanks. Um, I will further on when, when you see the questions join the questions on the valid chain and OTTs because I believe OTTs are one part of the value chain so we need not tackle the questions separately but I would like to ask one question. Is SDN and if we, if it works, if all the programmability works, is it going to kill the internet? The internet and, and that's basically that's the internet that's is your relationship the with that neutrality obviously then. <laughs> um, but I think, but I let's think put it a bit simplistic. <laughs> Clearly, I, I mean, from my point of view, very clearly, the internet's already dead. Um, surfing, no one surfs anymore. You, you transact in the cloud is what you do when you're on your computer. For, for whatever you do that, is, that used to be thought of as surfing in the internet, you're in fact triggering transactions in the cloud. So the question becomes, how do I get to the cloud and how do I get back? I think the MEF thinks quite strongly that layer two has some revenge to play here because the ubiquitous nature of IP suited the, the ubiquitous um, <coughs> requirements of uh, surfing on the internet. Uh, that's over. We don't, no one does that anymore. It, when you think of Facebook, when you think of going on eBay, when you think of anything that you do, so the internet, th that's dead and gone. The question is, the ramp on into the cloud, is that going to be layer two? Is it going to be layer three? Clearly for the enterprise, <coughs> for Microsoft to offer um, real-time <coughs> applications and licenses for Word or PowerPoint that are really real-time, that on-ramp has to be layer two. It has, the light, it has the delay, it has the bandwidth, and so on and so forth. <laughs> I'm being controversial on purpose, of course. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so that, that, that would be uh, my view. But there's no, no uh, yeah, f f first of all, uh, when we're talking about the internet, we have to be very careful what we're talking about. Because the internet, the internet is the social internet, the technical internet, the, uh, uh, the economic internet, which is something completely different. The, the internet as, the, as a social concept in which people interact with a, with a um, higher degree of freedom than anywhere else in history, and this is true, probably for sure not, and, 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 I, and I, I hope nothing will end the internet in, the, in, the, in those terms. The internet as a, as a, uh, as a, as a structure, uh, um, network, according to these uh, famous fi uh, five layers in which you have tier ones, uh, tier twos, you have uh, root registries, and I, I hope so, 
because the uh, this model is showing already or already showing uh, signs of uh, that is being uh, exhausted. It's coming to an end because very likely this internet, uh, even with all the um, um, uh, uh, push around uh, IPv6, understanding the uh, the model, etc. I think that uh, new uh, uses like IoT and the pervasive and networking, etc., is going to kill that model simply because it w it won't scale that much. As, as, as it is, uh, think about simply about the expansion of the of the other space using IPv6. Very likely will cause another crisis like the one that was with the routing tables at the 90 something. Because nobody's aggregating right now uh, or, or planning to aggregate IPv6 net, uh, addresses. Though, th that means that we will have to explore new ways of making this interconnection among humans and non humans and non human entities connected to the network to warranty global availability and, uh, um, and global resiliency and, and the possibility of communicating with everything. Uh, recently, well, today there is a meeting in London, and it's, uh, I, I'm not there because I'm here, which is about an, a new Etsy group that, that, that is called New Generation Protocol. They, this has been studied by a, a few guys that think that would be interesting to start thinking in those terms. And, uh, <coughs> well, there, there have been, have been, yesterday I went through some of the presentations, and there are people that are. Pro, uh, uh, um, proposing really radical changes, and there are others that are simply considering how we deal with TCP congestion. For I, I, I consider myself more in connected to the first ones than to the second ones because, ah, you know, solving TCP congestion is a very interesting problem, but it's TCP. Come on. Uh, so the idea at the end is something, and, and, the, and the, the idea I'd like to. Uh, best of the ones that we review, uh, review is precisely this uh, uh, one which is about having uh, local address spaces that interconnect, freely interconnect by additional layers on top of it. And this, uh, the, the guy who was proposing it called this uh, the, the wallless garden. So it is installed of having a walled garden in which you control everything that is connected, could you provide this an open playground where each one of your customers can bring additional connection on top of it. Which is something that, well, I see that uh, with uh, software technologies would be much, uh, much more feasible. And probably it's somehow connected with your idea of layer two, though it would not be necessarily layer two. So, when we look at internet, it's remaining delivering packets with un unpredictable speed and unpredictable time. And I think there's a market for something much bigger. Of course, we'll keep the internet as best effort for probably internet of things, but what about having for consumers and to end SLAs on services? And when we look at um, access technologies, we're moving to predictable access technologies. If I take uh, vectoring over copper DSL technologies, we actually are able now to um, know exactly what will be the speed of each access line, which wasn't the case with the earlier DSL technologies. And then another point is that we're removing also the bottlenecks um, on the access lines when we look at TWD and PON. If we can do 10 gig symmetrical, if we can combine in the future uh, multiple pairs of wavelength, where is the bottleneck in the future on, on access? So there's a market for the future to have much more quality, let's say, assured services. We also see on the market that some players are also looking at quality assured interconnection, and it's, it's happening. So my, my comment was um, almost, I mean, not a joke, but it's like when you said, you know, are killing the internet and so on, I was thinking, actually, you know, maybe it's going to go beyond that. It's going to kill, you know, the operator's network business. Uh, because anything can be a resource and anything can be an NAVI node. Everything is software. So tomorrow, you know, an enterprise just like Amazon, you know, an enterprise selling books became the, I mean, biggest cloud provider. Anybody can run a virtual EPC, I mean, open air interface, open source APC runs on a VM. I mean, there's a whole bunch of these, you know, open source projects, you know, uh, I mean, having this kind of software that runs on a VM, which can be on your PC, which can be on a drone, which can be on a car. 
I mean, ITS is working on this vehicle to vehicle and so on. I mean, the end model could be, you know, just devices talking to devices and no more, you know, operators. No more humans. <laughs> yeah, no more humans. humans, yeah. So I think one of the... Uh, I mean, that's like future, future. <laughs> one of the points I would make is rather than, than killing the internet, I think it actually will enable the internet to grow in new dimensions. So we had some discussion of... Um, uh, quality of service and so mov moving towards the industrial internet supporting the internet of things y you'd need some different capabilities in the network and deployment of, of NFEI nodes at the edge gets you some of those capabilities because you get a lower latency you get the possibility of, of multi-tenancy in that environment um, and, and to give another example that's that's current in the IETF is the the information centric network activities whether the world goes there or not, I don't know, but it's certainly a completely different forwarding paradigm. <laughs> um, and to do that, you need you need virtual functions that can be deployed to, to do that operation, right? So in that sense, things like NFE provide a, a, enable new paths of evolution for the internet. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, I thought that was quite an interesting, it was quite an interesting little ex excursion. <laughs> uh, to um, to ask that question, I've heard about quality of service a lot uh, for 10 years already. Um, the internet has worked quite well so far, but let's see. Um, let's see. Now, perhaps let's uh, then move to this value chain question. And um, I think um, so. We've I think seen a very nice slide. Um, you showed on the on the different actors of the value chain and how it could uh, sort of uh, decouple in, in in different layers and different functionalities. Um, obviously, I will want to join the OTT question to it because nowadays the OTTs are are the application players, and we have been before you talking about the fact that they may join. And if it if you follow up on on uh, um idea, uh, everyone can become a network operator programming software. So, so let's, let's perhaps come back to this issue of um, the value chain. For me, it was still very difficult to get a real idea. I, I'm sorry, I come back to my horizontal and the vertical, uh, the vertical and the horizontal issue, um, because indeed, to me, it's a simple internet allowing free innovation on the application layer without any control of the transport. Normally the networks have been spiders in the middle and they had a tendency to control services. Um, oh yes, value added services in 800 numbers, 900 numbers. What a mess to offer such a service. Now over the internet you simply offer the service and you don't have to deal with all of this. So it was, I think at least that's why so many people think the internet has been uh, has contributed largely to innovation over the past five to ten years. Um, now, with this um, view of the decoupling thing, it to me, the, to me, the summary of today is pretty much there won't be any decoupling outside operators. At least that's what operators will strive for. Because anyways, it's so complicated, you better first start within your own organization. And you try to um, bring back some vertically integrated optimization. <laughs> um, but I don't know whether that's the right impression. Perhaps you can correct me or add or whatever. Um, I think Marie Paul m mentioned um, earlier with that with that great diagram, th and th the conclusion is fairly straightforward. The value chain is going to become much more complicated because there will be new actors coming into the into the value chain, and then we will have to decide w what is part of the service, what is over on top of the service, and that. That seemingly simple question will, in fact, become quite complex. 
and I would dare say probably too complex for, for regular regulators to really um, be able to hold, gra grab on to something, in, I guess, to, to, to regulate. Um, so you'll probably uh, remain roughly at the level, at least for carrier ethernet, uh, that you are today without having to go into these, these complex uh, questions. The only danger would be really if, um, as also as Maripur was suggesting, if OTT takes over the world. Um, then, th th but uh, I think it's too early to, to, to start speculating, speculating about that. But, but I believe the first step is just um, that the value chain will, uh, there will be new actors and it'll be much more difficult to understand exactly what, a ser what service uh, Heinrich is actually offering his customer and what the components are. No, I, I, I wanted to make a reflection on one thing. When we're talking about OTT and, and network operators, the real distinction are two, basically. One, I mean, well, first of all, there are very different OTTs. Uh, Google is supposed to be an OTT, and a small firm that is trying to deal with B2B in one corner of Slovenia is another OTT. As they have nothing to do at all. And we all call them OTT because they are relying on packet networks to provide their services. First. Second, in general, OTTs, what OTTs have really benefit is, let's be frank, of the fact that they have not been regulated. In the moment, if Google started with their brand new search engine, and in, in, in a couple of years, it would have been obliged to, to share all their, all their databases with the competition, come on. Where would Google be? This is, well, the question is where, whether someone would have started Google <laughs> at all. So, so that means, and the real difference right now is that a few OTTs have extremely deep pockets and they can invest in whatever they want. They could buy all, I mean, Google or Apple could buy all of us inside. I mean, physically us, not only our companies. <laughs> and, and this is something that, that somehow distorts as well the market because you, you have much more powerful players, because the advantage here is that if we manage to achieve this uh, blurring of the, of the, uh, of the uh, differentiation between wh who is above the network, who is below the network, because the network is part of the, of, the, of the application and the application part of the network, then the possibilities of new players coming out from the operators, coming out from the OTTs, or, or completely new players that have been so far, I don't know, producing uh, butter, and they decide to, to join, probably that will be, will be changing completely the value chain. And, that's it. and, and I think this is, this is a good opportunity for everyone. Um, two statements from my side. The first is, the world will not work only with OTTs, because if everybody goes to the cloud and everything is within the cloud, you still need to get yes. to the cloud, you still need to connect. So all the OTTs can only survive if some network operators also survive. So the value chain overall will only work if both do this somehow together. And I personally think a, a clever operator will offer different services, not only a pure connectivity, but depending on what, what his OTT and his customer then in the future might be. If there's an OTT, a startup just at the market which is focusing on video services, they don't want in the first phase care about network connectivity because this is a special know-how you have to have. You don't just install something on a virtual machine and you run a carrier-grade network with all the resiliency and all the huddles you have. So at a network operator, you should offer a basic connectivity service for those who wants to run a lot of services by themselves on top, but you should also offer services which are very, very network centristic or even services like security which others, which some OTTs don't want to produce by themselves. So the value chain in general will vary depending on your customer. The customer is then no longer, or not only the residential customer ordering the connection, but also the OTTs which get an interaction with you. But it's better than today where mainly the OTTs don't talk to the operators at all. They just run on top. So you can just grow on the value chain. Yeah. So maybe a different uh, take on things. It depends a little on, on, on what you think of as, as comprising the links in the value chain. Um, in w one way to think of the, the links in the value chain is, is what's the, the scope of things that you can control to optimize. 
uh, and in the traditional approach, the, uh, the the integrated software hardware piece is, is a vertically integrated thing, and, and that's one chunk in the, the value chain. When you split that apart, uh, now you're trying to optimize at different layers. So you're trying to optimize hardware uh, across pieces of equipment that traditionally came from different vendors. You're trying to optimize chunks of software across um, pieces that came from different vendors. So, so, so there's a, a different um, optimization strategy that, that goes on there. The, the OTT players are, are uh, potentially a different entrant at the network service layer for different services, depending on what their particular um, niche of activity is. But um, I think there is a, a difference in, in the scope of, of resource optimization that, that the different uh, um, players in the industry will, will focus on. Uh, I think um, OTTs, the hyperscale people, are about frictionless connectivity, really. If they have to think about um, connecting to you on that network and you on that network and you on that network, forget it. That's not their game. They, they, they succeeded because the internet gave them the, whatever the internet is, it was the device that gave them the ability to get to anybody anywhere in the world without configuring anything particularly difficult in the network. You know, if I've got internet connectivity and peering, I can reach it. And actually, I don't care what network you're on and what facilities you're using on that network. And as we go to mobile, we start to see things done in the SGI land that optimize things if you're on different RAN. So it, it's all kind of in that space. And the fundamental question is, what value will emerge that might enable you to keep that simplicity from an OTT perspective, but maybe get more out of the network? I don't know, but it feels like if we're going to get benefits from SDN and NFB in that space, it's got to be kind of there. It's something that lets them remain frictionless, but lets them get more out of the network. I think it's probably a bit of a challenge. May I um, ask one thing that also came out of the discussion for me today? Um, it wasn't very clear, but it was kind of clear that smaller network operators were thinking more positively about the decoupling of certain, say, control orchestration or things like that, or, or thinking about a neutral player for this functionality, whereas other operators would rather now emphasize it, it's, I know that we are in the blue, but more emphasize the problems of disintegrating things that are too complicated because there are too many options. I, is there such a, um, have I heard that rightly, or is there no such tension between the smaller and the larger network operators? When you look at me at the smaller operators, I agree with your statement. We are not much bigger than you, you know, uh, maybe three times, but uh, not, not more. Uh, and, uh, well, we don't see uh, uh, that much hope in, uh, in decoupling. <coughs> uh, well, we think that decoupling will, uh, will be a, a about uh, extending the level of interoperability, but not about, uh, so, so I would say, uh, extending the, what I call the telecom promise. Uh, which is, you know, what you what you can do, whatever your provider. But it, uh, this is, you know, uh, if I take another analogy, uh, which is uh, the telephone numbering space, this has been frozen with uh, the s the service set of 1990, uh, and it's cr it's crazy. We could have done a lot of things with that, uh, and uh, we um, so uh, uh, for whatever is common. But whether it's uh, you know the DNS um, uh, no domain name uh, system, whether it's uh, the uh, IP addresses, whether it's the telephone numbers, it's what do we do to enhance uh, the um, the list of services that you can do with it? Well, for um, for the first two we have we have succeeded, for uh, the third one we have failed. Why? You know that, that's uh, that's the issue, and uh, uh, SDN and NFV will uh, will be about you know uh, doing more things for our networks uh, over the boundary of third-party networks, 
because nobody is ubiquitous. Uh, only the customers uh, ask us to, uh, to serve them everywhere. Yes, uh, we're approaching our deadline, and now we move on to the last question of the panel discussion. Uh, will Estin NLV have further regulatory implications? In the presentations, several further uh, implications were mentioned, and also the potential that there can be much more implications. Uh, one aspect which is of relevant for us is, uh, more from a technical <laughs> point of view, it was mentioned in one presentation with regard to critical infrastructure, whether networks based on SDN and NLV will uh, have a reliability which will achieve a, a, at least approximately the same level of the reliabili reliability of networks of today. So who think that th the networks based on SDN and NLV will achieve the same reliability level? Maybe you can raise your hand. Okay. Uh, in principle, in the long term. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, the okay. Okay. Those. It's. Okay. Then I think. Yes. Uh, is there any question or comment any or question? from the audience? To whatever question we have discussed. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. um, yes, maybe maybe one comment. So what we can observe is that um, the telco industry increasingly has to operate or, or develop at the speed of the software industry. And um, if you think now what uh, will be the telecommunications framework in five years, then I think it should be also important <laughs> to speed up in general regulatory processes so that um, regulation not has to be planned five years in advance because the industry is not able to plan five years in advance. Um. Yeah, I, I, I fully understand your, your view, but there is a, a further di uh, uh, discipline we have to take into account. Maybe it was not very uh, strong uh, represented today, and there's the legal dimension because the legal uh, laws have their own laws and their own <laughs> time frame and yes, it's maybe not uh, very appropriate but of course uh, it the regulation needs to be based on, 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 on law. Uh, but perhaps um, let me sum one thing. We, there are quite a few regulators in the room and I can assure you within Barrick we don't dream about um, regulating specific functionalities as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, Thank okay, you. Can, I, can I tell you this uh, very honestly? We are trying to understand where the future moves. And in that respect, we are also trying to, since there will be a debate on the review and on, uh, in the legal sense, um, it will maybe a very important, we, we, we should have at least the perspective of the future when drafting such legal test texts that will have to be, uh, that will work for quite a while. I must say for me today, um, since there are so many open questions, I, I think it will be very difficult to, to make mm -hmm. any kind of um, very concrete reference to all of this. You can just think about um, drafting texts in such a way that they can tackle future problems in a very broad way because regulation, um, if you think about this complexity that um, you, you had on the, uh, on the value chain slide, uh, I think no regulator dreams about looking into each of these um, APIs in great detail because that's going to kill us. Um, there is, it's, it's um, we, we are already facing um, this challenge with net neutrality on, in monitoring, say, traffic management and things like that. And um, there is many, many open questions here. So this could, um, this, uh, the, the, the visions we had today would multiply these whole processes. And obviously we also have to think about <coughs> procedurally elegant solutions. So I think that was a very inspiring workshop 
for us, and I don't think you need to be very much afraid that whatever you said today is going to generate anything terrible coming um, coming in, in the future. It just helps us reflect, I think, some very important um, solutions, and I think we may be very happy if we can come come back to you when we have stupid questions um, in the future. But um, I think it has been very helpful for us, and um, there is no striving for overregulation. Um, we just have to understand where the future problems could be. Okay, then I think it's necessary to say ma very much thanks to all of the presentations. It was very interesting and also very much thanks for the questions and comments of the audience and thank you.